Well, good morning, everyone. This is Penny from Wisconsin Land and Water. Um, thank you for joining us for the second webinar in this um, Erosion and Control Products webinar series. And we will be taking questions through the chat box as well. And we, you can interrupt Riley anytime. Kelly Neitzel from DACCAP will be sharing a few things with you today. So she will be presenting sometime in the middle and then at the end, she will be talking as well. I think that's about it. Riley, are you out there and ready to take yep. over? Yep. And if you want to put your yeah. camera on so people can, I don't know, do you have it on? If you could put it on so people could just see who our presenter is. Kelly Neitzel is the other one that's on there that is going to be talking and helping with this as well. Well, and thanks, Kelly. Kelly's the one who actually brought this idea forward to us. So I am very happy that Kelly did that because we have quite a few people registered for this. Can I say a few things before we turn it over to Riley? Sure. Yep. So I just wanted to, since I did not get to present at our last webinar, to really tie this back into what NRCS and LCD technicians do. Um, I believe, so whatever we missed last week was just a general overview of the things we're going to cover more in depth in the next two webinars. So I believe Riley is going to just do the more in depth part. So I just wanted to jump on here at the beginning and lead off with how this relates to what we do technicians so this is the temporary erosion control blanket webinar and just for your reference it falls under our mulching standard so these are they're used to get grass established but there's it's, you said it's a mulching kind of thing so it's not uh, additional protections otherwise um kind of thing. yeah uh, so we'll cover the turf reinforcement matting next week and that will get us into a different standard, the line waterway standard. I think that's all I need to cover today and I'll jump in on at the end and go through a few more things of how you want to use these in your projects. So I will let Riley introduce himself now and go on with the rest of the presentation. Okay. Yeah, so if you weren't on last time, um, well, thank you, Penny and Kelly um for having me um if you weren't on last time my name is riley stenzel i'm the territory manager for american excelsior company um last time we went over a brief overview of what american excelsior has to offer and uh just a general overview about erosion control um we were going to get into a little bit of sediment control at the end but we're going to touch on that in the next presentation next week. So today uh, we'll be talking about temporary erosion control blankets, um, how they can be used, um, we'll talk a little bit about their kind of their general pricing, uh, how to install them properly, and to make sure that they work for uh, whatever circumstance you guys will use them in. So you can see my um, information below. Feel free to take that down, uh, my email and cell, um, and then the area I cover. And like Penny said, feel free to jump in at any time. If you have a question, um, I like when it's more interactive. So if you have a question, feel free to stop me. Or if you feel more comfortable waiting until the end, that's fine too. And then also there is a chat box. If you wanna type it in the chat box, um, I can stop then and, and answer it when you ask it. So uh, I talked a, a little bit about this last time, but American Excelsior does have an erosion lab. Um, it's up in Rice Lake, Wisconsin. It's the largest privately owned research and testing lab of its type in North America. Um, some activities we do out there is large scale ASTM performance testing, research and development, contract testing. Uh, we do industry education seminars. I don't know if anybody's familiar with um, like the Wisconsin Erosion Control Association. Um, we host them every year, usually around this time this year with the conditions it won't be happening, but um, we always like when people come up there and visit and we can show them what we do up there. 
and we can uh, we can also do things that maybe they would like to see testing on in a certain way um, we can try to set it up as closely as how it would be in the field and and we hopefully can set it up as closely as possible because a lot of the testing that happens for a lot of these products are, are pretty controlled environments and it doesn't really mimic exactly what's going on out in the world. So our ASTM large scale testing, you can see we have our channels and our slopes with rainfall. Um, other manufacturers like to rely on, on different test methods to make the results of their products look better. So on our slopes, um, we have 12 eight by 40 plots at a three to one gradient. And then we also have five eight by 35 plots at an eight to one. Um, and we can, we can pump these up to about eight inches of rain per hour. So some stuff that you guys could help make your jobs easier. Um, always, you can always check out our website. We have an online technical support library. Um, it contains a ton of great information, um, specs, CAD details, staple patterns, uh, cross-reference sheets. We have all of our um, PDS sheets, uh, anything, uh, anything you can really think of. Um, if you if you need help figuring out how to install something, uh, we do have installation details. Pretty much anything on there that you need, it's pretty user friendly. Just go to the erosion part, go to the technical support library, and you should find everything there. Uh, we do have a YouTube channel that you can see a lot of our videos that we do of our research at the lab. You can see videos of stuff we've done in the field, and uh, some of the videos that'll be on here will, will also be on that YouTube channel. And then last week, I also talked about our free rainfall and channel erosion analysis and design software called Erosion Works. Um, and I encourage everyone to check that out because, like I said, it is free and it is a great tool to um, see a lot of different things and, and help you decide what product would work best for the job uh, that you're specking. And then it also obviously you know, it saves all those for you and you can pull it up in the field and you can put general pricing in there and you'll have a, a pretty good idea what the project's gonna cost down to the staple. So slope application guide, um, these will be on our, on our website as well. Same with the channel application guide. It just kind of tells you um, what every thing's gonna hold up to. So you can see down at the bottom, I'm um, single that straw, in a channel, you're looking at about a pound and a half of shear stress all the way up to a trinet TRM with, or it's a three netted TRM, which will hold up to 14 pounds of shear stress. So a pretty wide range of products. Um, and then you can see in the parentheses, obviously the ones in the blue are all gonna be permanent, but anything down below, you can see their, their functional longevity. So the single net straw, you're gonna be under 12 months. Um, a high velocity curl X you're looking at 36 plus, as well as, you know, coconut about up to a th 36 months. So erosion control versus sediment control. Um, the erosion control works to prevent that soil from moving, but once that soil does start moving and you get those particles in the water, then it's sediment control. So if we use proper erosion control, that minimizes the need for that sediment control. So today we're gonna to talk about what we can do to properly use um, the tools we have to. So what is erosion? Um, this is kind of the formula we use for erosion. Um, I like to show this, just to show um, how we do it at the lab. Um, here's, a, here's a graph that shows the soil that you'll lose compared to the percent of ground cover. So you can see um, you're gonna lose a lot less pounds per acre as the percentage of ground cover you, you get covered.
So today we're going to be talking about the temporary erosion control blankets. Um, these are going to be biodegradable blankets. So what they're there for is to hold the seed in place, hold the soil in place until that vegetation is established and the vegetation is strong enough to hold up to whatever conditions it may see um, in the future. Uh, once that vegetation isn't going to be strong enough to hold, um, a lot of times in those channels that are, you're going to see a lot of water flow, a lot of shear stress, then you're going to have to move to a turf reinforcement mat. So what do erosion control blankets do? They're going to intercept raindrops, slow down runoff. Um, they're going to hold that soil in pl place and prevent it from being washed away. And they're going to provide ideal growing conditions for the seeds and the plants. So we'll talk about the different types of blankets, um, different types of nettings, and all the different variations you can have with those blankets. So we talked about this a little bit last week. The three degradable fiber types that you're gonna see in a temporary erosion control blanket is gonna be a coconut, a straw, or a wood fiber. And then there's also a, a coconut and straw blend, which is usually 70% um, straw and 30% coconut. So with that, you have the, yeah, you pretty much have your pick between those three different fills. And then you also have the pick between how many nets you want and the type of net. So here um, you can either have uh, most time or all the time with temporary rose club control blankets, you're either going to have one net or two nets. You can have the one net on top or with the two nets, it'll just be a net on the top and a net on the bottom. The different types of nets, um, there's a black net that usually lasts up to about 36 months or three years. Um, there's a green net that you can see here. Um, that net you're usually looking at about 12 to 18 months. And then there's a white net which you're looking at about 90 days or three months. And then on, if you, if you don't want to, the poly nets, these are all um, polypropylene nets. Uh, you can also get a 100% natural jute net, which you see here. So I talked last week about the different fills. Um, because of the straw being the smooth, flat, hollow fibers, you need to have these smaller openings, otherwise the net, it's all gonna fall apart. Because the Curlex wood fibers kind of tangle and hold themselves together, you can have these wider openings. So if there's any worry about animal entanglements, um, that helps a little bit with those wider openings. Also, if you're gonna use the all natural net, that helps as well, because you can see if you look close here, there's no welded joints, so this is very, flexible, can move around, and that'll also help uh, worrying about animal entanglements. The industry as a whole um, is actually going a lot more towards these jute nettings because they are worried about, you know, even though those poly nets will degrade, um, they still get those little microplastics in the water that people get worried about because that ends up getting in, um, our wildlife um, gets in our water, gets in our food, and, and they just, even though you can't see them, they are there. So that's why the industry is starting to move more towards this jute net. Um, actually, in 2020, this year, Minnesota's Department of Transportation went completely towards jute net, so they don't accept anything but an all natural net. So talking about the fibers again, um, the coconut fibers, um, they do have poor carbon footprint because they are coming from um, overseas. They're not made here. Um, some issues with the coconut fibers is they are the dark brown, so you can see seed burn out because they do get pretty hot. Uh, a lot of times they do get treated with salt before they get shipped over here. Um, so that can cause some germination issues. But with the coconut fibers, they are tough fibers. 
and they do last a long time. So a lot of times you're going to get three years out of a blanket. A lot of times up in our area in Wisconsin and really anywhere in the Midwest, we, we don't see issues with with vegetation. You don't really need that that 36 months out of a blanket. So this um, a lot of times coconuts not really needed as much up in this area as it is in areas where they don't see vegetation growing through as quickly as we do. So the straw fibers, like I said earlier, um, smooth, hollow fibers, uh, they, they don't hold themselves together. So with the straw fibers, you really only want to use these on really, really flat surfaces where you're not going to see any sort of concentrated flow. Um, the other issue with the straw fibers is that it is an ag byproduct. And even though they require them to be weed seed free, um, you're always going to get seeds in here. And straw, straw blankets are being made from all around the country. So a lot of times you are getting seeds moved around from different areas of the country. Uh, which can cause some issues um, bringing them up here. So if there's going to be any type of, of concentrated flow, um, straw is probably not the best choice, but it is the cheapest. So if it's flat, a flat surface, um, a lot of times it works great in like yards, um, then, it, then it's great. But as you can see here, a, a pretty general, I guess, slope here um which straw straw would be approved for this type of slope but you can see that the issues with straw if a wa rain event does come in before vegetation established you can see that the the seed did fall down to the bottom of the slope so you didn't get any vegetation at the top and and that can be the issue there but like i said it is the cheapest so if if it's a money saving issue then um it can be a good option uh, this is where I like to see straw and where I think it works the best in these flat revegetation areas because you don't have to worry about losing any of that blanket or any of that seed. Um, it'll all stay put pretty well. So then the Curlex wood fibers, uh, they are naturally seed free because they come from an aspen tree. Uh, you can see the way we cut them, they're engineered with curls and barbs. Uh, they do a greenhouse effect because they do absorb water really well and they hold that water over the seed bed, which allows vegetation to be established fairly quickly in and in a nice uniform growth. Uh, they do conform to irregularities in the soil because when they absorb that water, they grow, they, it expands, it contracts when it, when it gets wet and dries. So it does grow into that soil. Um, grows into those imperfections in the soil and it, it almost causes like a Velcro effect, which is what we want because then it'll hold that seed down. You, won't, you don't have to worry about that seed moving around. You don't have to worry about the soil moving because it'll hold it all in place. And then you get the protection from the sun burnout when raindrop impact and overland flow. So some other features and benefits of the Curlex. Um, it does have a higher Manning's N, so this is going to provide a roughness. It's going to help slow water velocity, and it's also, as you can see in this picture, um, will cause sedimentation and allow it to grab that soil that's already moving. So um, it can't, obviously, it, it's great for erosion control, but you can also get it as a type of sediment control as well, as you can see in this picture. So this is just a, a quick video. Um, this video uh, doesn't seem to be working. Worked earlier. Uh, um, well, I guess you get to see some same thing here. You can see it. So we put straw over some imperfections of the soil. We use track voids in the soil. Um, and then we also did it with Curlex wood fiber, and you can see getting we're just getting them both wet at the same time here. Um, you can see how the straw is just going to bridge over that imperfection or that track void, where the Curlex wood fiber is going to grow into that 
into that imperfection or that track void in the soil in this case. The reason we did this quick little study is because we did have a project where um, they were driving over the dirt quite a bit get, while they were preparing the soil and getting it ready. And there's a lot of track voids in it and it was a pretty flat surface. So um, the, the straw blanket seemed like a great option for this project, but the water kept getting underneath and getting into those track voids and it was eroding from underneath the blanket because of it. Um, they had to go back, they put the Curlex blanket down and it ended up working great. So that's where we got this study from. So I wanted to put this on here um, just so you guys have a general idea. Um, this obviously can vary quite a bit throughout each year. Um, I'll be talking a little bit about all these different types of blankets, but I wanted to show um, kind of the general pricing. So I put, I did them all as a double net product instead of, like I said, there is single net products as well. But a lot of times, if there's going to be any sort of concentrated flow, you're going to want the extra net for protection. So uh, you can see the double net straw blanket, you, you are going to have, that is the cheapest, at about 37 cents per square yard. And um, it's one, one thing I didn't mention earlier, um, the straw and the coconut blankets, um, you are getting a half pound per square yard of product in there where with the Curlex blanket, you're getting 0.73 pounds of product in there, so you get a little more weight. And then um, some other Curlex blankets that I'll talk about earlier or later is a one pound per, per square yard of, of product in between those nets. So um, you can see, moving on, so the straw coconut blanket, like I said, that's 70% straw, 30% coconut, um, 50 cents a square yard. Curlex CL blanket, another one I'll talk about. So um, this was a new product that we came out with, I guess not too new now, but a while back to help combat the the price difference between straw and curlex um and we stretch it out into a 150 foot blanket only put a half pound in there instead of the standard 0.73 pounds and got it a little bit closer as you can see um still about seven cents per square yard difference but the performance is so much different than a straw blanket that um i think most people are willing to pay that seven cents extra um just a standard double neck curlex the 56 cents per square yard uh, coconut um, you can see is the most expensive at about 73 cents per square yard and then the heavy duty blanket that we've used the most with the NRCS in in at least in the bottom part of those ditches at 68 cents per square yard oops so I want to talk about this one um, wouldn't prefer this one being in definitely in any waterways because there is no net at all but i wanted to talk about it because it is great not having that net on there it's obviously great for the environment 100 percent biodegradable blanket um we call it the self-healing blanket because um like in this picture on the right you can see that you can just spread it apart plug plants through it it works great um, you want to see it more on a, a flatter surface kind of like the double and single net straws but it you still get the benefit of those curlex fibers uh, really holding that seed and, and soil in place so the curlex one this is the original erosion control blanket that was made in the 60s uh, just a single net on top Works great on a lot of different applications. You can see the slope here, um, housing developments. This one's approved two to one slopes and then 1.75 pounds of shear stress. And then the velocity is seven feet per second. You get about with, you can put all the different types of net on here, but you get about up to 18 months of longevity. Curlex 2, this is probably our most used blanket across the nation. Um, see the one and a half to one slope, two and a quarter pound of shear stress, and then up to 24 months. Uh, 
pretty much the same thing as the Curl X1 blanket, but you do have that extra net on the bottom. So you get a little more protection with that extra net. And you can see um, what it looks like after install on the right. And then once vegetation starts growing through on the left. Some more pictures of the Curl X2 and some different applications for it. So the Curl X2 versus coconut based products, um, you saw the, the price difference before the coconut is more. Um, the coconut, you, you're going to get versus the Curl X2, you're going to get a longer functional longevity because the Curl X2, uh, we usually rate out to about 24 months where coconuts up to 36 months, so about another year. Um, the Curl X2, you get the 7.73 pounds per square yard compared to the half pound in the coconut. So a little bit heavier blanket, which is good, helps hold that to the dirt a little bit better. And then um, the Curl X2 is kind of in the price range of the straw coconut blend. So the Curl X CL blanket, um, I want to talk about this one because this is the one we've used a lot with the NRCS, uh, especially around the Rice Lake area where we make a lot of our blankets. So what we've done mostly is putting a heavy duty Curlex 2.98 blanket right down the center of, of the waterway, because that's where you're going to see the most shear stress and you don't want any of that product coming up. So we do the heavy duty one right down the middle and then we usually line the sides with CL because you're not going to get as much shear stress up the slopes on those waterways and you don't need that heavy duty 9-8 blanket through the whole thing. Uh, so to save the money, um, we recommend the CL up, up the sides. CL is a 150 foot blanket. It's a half pound per, half pound per square yard. And, and it comes with a single and a double net. Obviously, if it's gonna be in a waterway, we prefer the double net, so the Curl X2 CL, because you want that extra protection if there's gonna be any sort of concentrated flow. And you can see what they're rated for down here in the bottom. So some just some things I touched on. Um, we did stretch it out into the 100 foot, 50 foot blanket because it helps with freight purposes. Um, allows you to get more on a truck to save money for the contractors. Um, it is lighter weight compared to the 0.73 pound cur normal Curlex blankets. So it's easier for, for people to carry around. Uh, is there a question? Uh, CL, so CL, the reason they call it the Curlex CL is because CL is the Roman numeral for 150. Um, our standard blankets come usually in eight by 112 and a half where the Curl X CL is an eight by 150, or it can be 16 foot too wide, but the CL is just for 150 because it's a 150 foot long blanket. So this is the Curl X 2.98. Um, this is the one we've used a lot with waterways in the NRCS. Um, you can see here, this is a waterway up just south of, of Barron, Wisconsin. Um, I think this is in Ridgeland, actually. And you can see, um, we took this picture in the exact same spot. You can see that little building in the background. Um, the reason you can't see it in day 120 is because the corn's grown up. So it is behind there. You can see the trees. Um, we are in the exact same spot there, but you can see the day one up to day 120 how well those those products work and and like i said before the reason we we prefer the 98 is because some of these waterways tend to get quite a bit of a flow down them so um the 98 down the center gives it a little more protection a little more peace of mind that you're not going to have to go out there and redo it uh, keeps that seed in place this is actually um the product that the Iowa DOT uses in all of their ditch bottoms as well. Um, it has to be the, the heavier duty Curlex 
Another application here, you can see it down the, the center. This is actually in Iowa. Um, the reason it's green is we can dye these pro our, our wood fiber green if if needed. Um, you know, I don't I don't think it's too important. Some some states like to see the green coloring because they think it looks more like the grass right away. It looks like a finished product. Um, then that's why this one's green here. So we we do offer larger rolls as well. Um, they come with a four inch core, and um, a lot of times farmers have have made different types of attachments on their tractors that they can just pull it. This one here is just attached on the side of a of a bobcat, and you can see how they can just roll it off with the core. With if it's just you can put like a carpet rod in there or anything, and it just rolls it right out like that. You still have to go back and easy to to roll out where you don't need people actually hand rolling them out. So, like I said, uh, a lot of farmers when they're putting their waterways in, they they make a little attachment with chains to a and they weld it to a carpet rod and put that on the back of their tractor and just drive slowly down the waterway and it just unrolls it for them and then they go back and staple it in. So we'll talk you guys get any questions on this too. Um, it's pretty easy. So you can see here, um, you cut the roll open. We have a red line to show where it starts. Um, and it, it just helps so they can peel that back a little, or they know where to peel. It's kind of like when you're peeling the start of a, like a, any sort of tape, it's kind of hard to get it started. That's why we put the red line on there so they know where where it gets started. And then on the curl X blanket, um, we can't do this on the straw or the coconut, but on the curl X blanket, we do reverse roll it at the end. So we put another line there. So when you know um, with the coconut and the straw ones, they get so tight here at the end that there's just no way of doing it. So a lot of times you have to snip that off and pitch that really tightly rolled end. Uh, but here we can reverse roll our, our Curlex and you can peel that back again. You get another 10 to 15 feet out of that roll. So that, I mean, that adds up on these projects as well. So slope installation, um, I guess I'm just gonna talk through this. If anybody has any questions or if you think I missed something, Feel free to stop me. Um, so these, all of these graphics you can see here are on our website, and they are you are able to copy and paste right off them into your own details if if that's what you want to do. Um, and they show different ways to install um, channels, slopes, um, how to trench them at the top and the bottom. So um, you'll see that here. So on a on a steep slope, you're gonna wanna, so the water is gonna be rolling down that slope. So on a steep slope, you're gonna wanna roll the blankets down the way the water is gonna be flowing. Um, a lot of times in, in waterways, those aren't steep enough. So what I say in waterways, just roll them straight down. You want the blanket going with the way the water is gonna flow. So unless unless there's a circumstance where the there's a steep slope on one side of of the waterway um i say just roll them straight down the waterway and not and not this way unless the the slope is steep enough where it's going to matter and there's going to be water rolling down it but over the top of a a slope you want to roll it at least three feet over the crest because you don't want that water getting underneath and undercutting that blanket and then you're going to want to trench it right there um, as you can see so the, there are different trenching methods um, I think they're both on here so you you dig out the trench and you can lay the roll like backwards I don't know if you guys can see my mouse cursor right here but it'd be the second one down 
Um, it says slope crest anchor method A right underneath that. So you can tip it upside down, um, staple it in there like that, a little flap in there, put the dirt back in, and then just roll it right back over. This is this one works the best, um, but you can also do it this way where you just the second one down from that, you peel back some of the blanket, put it 18 inches over. You go down through the trench and then 18 inches over, put the dirt back in and then just roll that flap over. Um, this one works as well. Um, I personally just don't think it works as well as um, rolling the whole blanket back over the top. And you really want to make sure you staple that that trench pretty well. And then you can see the overlap here. Um, overlap, you're going to want two to four inches of overlap and you want to staple it really well in those overlapped areas. So here's a, a closer image of the trenching method. Um, this is the second one I talked about that I personally don't think works as good, um, but it is an approved method that you can use. So like I said, uh, you dig the trench out, you put the blanket down in around the trench, staple it on the sides and on the bottom, put the dirt back in, and then that 18 inch flap, you flap back over and then staple it down right there. So you can, I, I wanted to show this picture because you can see what can happen um, if you don't use the right blanket or if you don't use the right method. So like I said, you want to trench it at the top or if you can't trench it, um, you want to roll it at least, um, I say usually, usually three feet over the crest to be safe. Um, you can see here they didn't do that and you can see the rails in the blanket and it's starting to erode. And that's only gonna get worse now because water is gonna continue to get in there and, and eat away at that. Closer up of, of some of those rails. So you can see here, it says you wanna go three feet above the crest or you wanna utilize the, the trenching method. So. Um, it should have went all should have went all the way up here, and obviously you can't go three feet over on this one, so it should have been trenched in right up here. So another thing you can find um, on our website, if you ever have a question about staple patterns, um, you can find it here. So this are staple patterns A, B, and C. You can see the different types of slope. And then on the channel, you can see C. And then right here um, is something you wanna check as well is the critical points of a channel. Um, so here you can kind of see this type of channel with, with those two critical points. You really wanna make sure you staple them heavy on those two points. Um, this one down here is more of an odd shaped channel. Um, so here would be the critical point that you wanna make sure that you get plenty of staples in. So here again, um, just showing that if you don't get everything trenched in right or three feet over the crest, um, you can really run into some some problems. Uh, this was a coconut blanket used here, and you can see that if you don't get the right amount of staples in there, you don't trench it in right, you're gonna end up with a mess like this and have to go back and redo it. So if you just get it done, well the first time um, it'll work great and then they don't have to go back and, and waste more time and money to have to go back and redo it. So I want to show this one because this is this is a, a steep slope that I was talking about that you want to go with the way the water is going to go. Um, again on waterways you're not going to run into a, a steep slope on the side like this. So more than likely, you're just going to want to go with the flow of the water. So channel installation. Um, this is a close up of that other uh, trenching method that I think works personally works the best. So if you flip the roll upside down and put it on the back side, so you can see the flow is going to be going down to the left here. 
So if you flip this upside down, roll some of the blanket out, put it through that trench right there, trench or, and then you want to staple the side, staple the bottom, put the dirt back in, and then you can just flip that right over the top. And that seems to be the best way to trench, in my opinion. And th then you can just roll that right down the, the way the flow is going to go. So you can see here, uh, I took testing, and you can see we trenched it in right at the edge here. And you can see how it's flush up against that and how the tr this is the, the trenching method that I talked about, the second one here that I think works the best, how they just flopped this right back over the top of it. Just a close up of the of the what it looks like after after the trenching is done. And this is just a, a the channel trenching method B again. So this this shows a graphic of the install in a channel. Um, so it looks like on this side. Um, that you want those blankets going down, but that's just because this this slope right here is super steep. Um, you can see on this side, it's not as steep, so they just go with the flow. Um, I would prefer that, like I said, in in all of the waterways. And then you can see these this area right here is blanket overlap. You wanna make sure that you have a staple check there with a, a good amount of staples. So you wanna overlap where the flow is two to four inches. Um, four to be safe, but two does work. Um, and you want to make sure that you have a good amount of staples right there for the staple check. Because if there if there's ever going to be a place where the blankets are going to fail, it's going to be on those overlap areas where maybe not enough staples got put in. But the same thing for overlap areas going this way and this. Oops, this overlaps here and going this way, you always want the two to four inches and you wanna make sure that you staple pretty heavily on those areas. Staple pattern guides again for the channel. So this, this isn't super important, but um, because a lot of times when people are out there going and stapling, um, they're just throwing them in there, but if possible, if if you can get them to do it, you want the staples facing the direction of the flow, so they're parallel with the direction of the flow. Um, if you put them perpendicular, um, a lot of times you can see the water digging underneath them and it'll pop those staples up. Or if you have them parallel with the flow, um, it helps a lot, it helps keep them in the ground a little bit better. And obviously you wanna, this picture is just showing, you know, the way you want them. These are just U pins. Um, this shows once you knock them in, you want them flush with the soil sur surface. So again, here, um, you can see this would be one of those critical points. You can see that he's he's stapling the critical point quite a bit right there. Um, this was in that in that graphic from earlier about the critical points in the channel this is where it's going to see the most stress is these two areas where it starts to go up the the slopes a little bit so here's a cheap uh staple check slot like we talked like i showed on that graphic earlier um where that where you're going to see the overflow of the two blankets so you got the looks like they got about four inches here of overlap, and then you can see that they stapled it heavy at the staple check. Um, this is just going to give you the peace of mind that none of those blankets are going to get come up when there's any sort of concentrated flow coming over those. Um, because, like I said, these are going to be the areas where if the blanket's going to fail, it's going to be in these areas right here. And I want to show this again because here are with the lines across here and here, and then right here. These are all gonna be the staple check areas where the overflow is. So 
So again, here's uh, the, um, this will just show the difference between straw. Um, these are stapled the way we want them. These are, this is our straw blanket. And you can see if there's any sort of concentrated flow, um, you're not gonna want straw in there. You can see how dirty that water is coming off there uh, because it is getting underneath that blanket and pulling soil in that water. You see the same thing with the Curlex, stapled the same way per our manufacturer specs. And you can see how not only does it slow the water, but it also keeps it on top. Um, that's from that roughness factor I talked about earlier. And you can see how much more clear that water is coming off compared to the straw. So the last thing I want to talk about is we do have an e-staple. Wow, looks like we have a question. Uh, so the question is, do you use the same type of length of staples for all soils? Uh, not necessarily, um, if, but in a channel, I would prefer at least a six inch staple. So a lot of times in flatter surfaces, um, you can get away with four inch staples, but if there's gonna be any sort of concentrated flow, like you'll see in waterways, um, I always prefer a six inch staple, but sometimes, um, you can't because there's such a hard layer underneath there. You can't get six inches in there before you hit some rock. So sometimes you have to use the four inch staple, but I always prefer a six inch um, or, or more if, if possible. Um, so the standard staple that we usually use is a four and a six inch U-pin, um, but we do have 100% biodegradable staples as well. Um, I know, some farmers like to use this in their waterways, whether, you know, depending on what they're gonna use with those waterways. If they're not gonna do anything with it, uh, usually the steel staple works fine, but if they're gonna go out there and, and mow that up, turn it into hay, uh, a lot of times they're gonna use an e-staple or if they have any cows out there um, eating that, they're gonna use an e-staple because they don't want that steel out there in that. So, um, it. I'm, I just wanted to state that the e-staple is an option. Um, they are 100% biodegradable. Um, they come in the six inch and the four inch. The only thing with the e-staple is that it is, compared to the, the steel staple, you're probably looking at like four times more in price. So um, uh, if if you're looking at a box of a thousand steel staples and it's fifty dollars or something for that those steel staples, you're you're gonna be looking at about two hundred for the e-staples. So they are a little more spendy, but they are hundred percent biodegradable. Um, the question is how long before the e-staple degrades? Uh that we don't have I, I guess a set date on that on or or a set longevity on these e staples because it all depends on the type of soil um they're going to last a lot longer in the sandier soils but if it's a rich soil with a lot of microbes uh, it's going to break down a lot quicker because that's what's breaking down the e staples um so it all depends on the type of soil and the type of conditions but um we have pretty pretty fertile soil up, up in Wisconsin and in the Midwest, so um, they do break down a lot quicker than, let's say, you know, Texas or something. Um, so yeah, it, it really just depends on on the types of soil and, and the microbes in those soils. So. on all the temporary blankets. I uh, I don't know if, I, I, I guess I kind of talked pretty fast on all of them. Um, I guess now if, if anyone has any questions on these different types of blankets, or if you think I missed anything, uh, feel free to unmute and, or you can say it right in the uh, chat. Uh, it looks like question here, do you only use grass seed with these mats or have you experienced with other species? If so, do you have a list of native species that do well with these mats? Um, 
Yeah, so I don't, I don't have a list for them. I, I can definitely get it, but we, we've used pretty much anything because we've used these blankets all over. Um, we use them in, in wetland areas. We use them in obviously DOT ditches. Uh, we use them pretty much all over. We haven't seen anything not be able to grow through them. Um, but I, I, I guess if that doesn't answer your question, I, I can get you a list of the ones that I know we've used in all of them. But yeah, we've pretty much used it with any sort of, of native species. Um, because a lot of times when, when we're around wetlands, you know, we're using a lot of those uh, native sod and native seeds, which with those deep roots and and we we've seen them work great with those so um i'll get i'll get back to that and see if i can get any more information on what type of species we've we've seen um i know kelly's going to talk about the um i guess approved products list maybe i think she said um and, and that's one thing i didn't talk about is you know, although we are in Wisconsin where we make all of our, our wood fiber, and that's why you know we're in Rice Lake because we get all that Great Lakes Aspen. Um, the Wisconsin's a little bit different. You know, we, we like to see people buy local, um, but we they also compared to other states like Minnesota, Iowa, and, and a lot of the surrounding states where um they rate all of the blankets differently. Um, Wisconsin's actually puts it more all, they kind of class them all together. So um, Curlux is classed in with the same as, as straw blankets, even though they perform a lot differently. Um, but I, I, I think moving forward in the next couple of years, that may change because we've seen a lot of states, um, actually the state of Iowa only uses wood fiber in, in most of their DOT work. Uh, Minnesota's starting to class theirs into only straw or only wood fiber. So if it's in a channel where there's gonna be any sort of concentrated flow, it's only gonna be wood fiber. Um, we see the same thing in Kentucky now. So that's kind of the way the industry is going towards is separating these blankets out more because they perform so much differently. And and hopefully, since we're in Wisconsin, um, they start to do that too because it's always going to come down to a price pricing point. So if if any of these contractors, whoever's laying the blankets, just sees the price and sees that they're classified the same, they're always going to take the cheapest product, even though they don't perform the same way. Uh, got another question: What percent of grade do you recommend placing blanket perpendicular to flow? channel three to one to four to one. Um, I, I guess I don't, like, are you talking about how steep the, like, if, if we're talking a waterway, how steep it would have to be to, to do perpendicular? If I, if I'm reading that, um, I, I don't, I don't consider it, more on the steepness is more so on how tall it actually is and a lot of times with waterways you just you're not like even if they are steep you're not they're not going to be very tall um so i guess it it, it kind of depends on how i mean I, I i'll check with my boss for that what we prefer on um the height of that slope but it really just has to make sense because with a lot of times with these blankets, like I said, you know, standard comes eight by 112 and a half. So you don't want to run them down that slope if it's not like a, a decently long slope, you know, like at least like 20, 30, 40 feet upwards, uh, because then you're just going to constantly be having to cut that blanket, bringing it back up. Um, so really, if it makes it easier, um, and the flow is going to be going down, just go parallel with it because 
it's going to be a lot of work to constantly have be having to cut it and, and bring it back to the top roll it down cut it where if it's not incredibly tall you can just roll it straight down if that answers the question i guess Like I said, um, my my contact info is still on here, so um, feel free to take that down. Contact me anytime with any questions you have on, on literally anything, um, whether it be an installation detail of some sort or um, having troubles. If you maybe if you checked out our Erosion Works platform, if you're having troubles with that and, and need some help with that, I can help with that really anything or if you're looking for pictures or studies or anything um i'm i'm always free to help you um this is penny so yeah keep on sending in your questions riley is this the end of your presentation that i should then make um kelly was going to do a little something yeah yeah Kel okay. kelly can Kelly can talk part. now, and um, if they keep sending in questions while she's talking, I will just wait okay. until she's done and answer those. Okay, I'll get Kelly transferred over. So people keep on sending in your questions, or you can unmute yourself too. There was one there from Mitch. Do you, product samples available? Yep, product samples are available. Um, I can drop those off uh, whenever needed, or I can also ship them to wherever. Um, we we have every single product that we have, we have samples of. Um, they usually come in little little squares. So I don't. If it works better, um, you can email me and and I can get them shipped right to you, or I can I can stop by and and drop some off as well. Okay, well Kelly's getting ready too. Just a reminder: if you want um, a PDH certificate or CEUs um, submitted for you, please email me at penny at wisconsinlandwater dot org, and I will get those sent out to you and there comes Kelly. Yep. So I was actually just looking some stuff up after Riley was talking about Wisconsin DOT not separating out the coconut mat from the straw mat because I was thinking they had but he is correct. Um, they're going to talk about one of the things I wanted to talk about was the DOT of PAL acceptability list so approved products basically is the way i would describe that and if we scroll down here they haven't separated out into classes and types if we scroll to the one that would be considered the mid-length um hold on let me make this bigger so you guys might actually be able to read it so for their class two is their mid length so you know lasts longer than straw but not as long as a turf reinforce a permanent turf reinforcement mat um their type a they have just jute mats which is because that's a type a is organic and go to the next page So the coconut is showing up under the type two. So they are separated. I just don't know, maybe not for the same reasons Riley is thinking. But anyway, so this is something I wanted to show you guys because it's something I use when I'm looking for what product to recommend or what class of product to recommend. So these classes, I do believe are the same ones the DOT uses, but I, this wording came out of an old um, ENR standard. And I, I say old just because they did update it last year and they removed this language for some reason, but from what I can tell this still applies. You just don't spell it out for some reason in the standard anymore. But I really like this 
breakdown. So you have the three classes. Um, what I was about the class two, the coconut or something that's um, you can see three years or greater listed there. Um, that's the coconut stuff he's been talking about. Um, and the Curlix ones we discussed today. And class three are the ones we're going to talk about next week. So you, the types are there, um, different peer stresses, which just to clarify, um, we're getting, we're always using velocity in our waterways, but we're getting at shear stress through velocity. So when Riley was talking about shear stress, a lot of times we're talking about velocity, but um, not exactly the same, but they have a correlation. And so we're usually just uh, referring to velocity when, when really we probably are to be talking about shear stress. So again, these classes and types then relate to the DOT, PAL. Um, these products have been reviewed by the DOT and as these ones that are acceptable on their jobs. So why I use this when I'm picking my erosion control matting is that I know it's a product that has been tested and I can, instead of just saying a class and a type in my plan, I can say a product on here. Um, you know, you can pick one of the Curlix ones Riley talked about today and call it out in your plan. The thing is when you do that in your plan, you need to use the phrase or equivalent because we cannot recommend or require a product for our jobs, just to be clear. So that's if I'm using this, it's usually I put it if I put it in a plan, it'll say or equivalent, just to give an example. Uh, and then it does make it easier if the contractor wants to choose products from these lists, you can easily tell if it's a similar product or not. Otherwise, we're going to be looking up individual product information and trying to determine where it would fall in the classes and the types and making sure it's going to work for your project. Um, that becomes particularly more important for the turf reinforcement matting stuff we'll cover next week. So then, next thing I wanted to show you or point out is we have a standard drawing for installation, which looks eerily like the ones that Riley was showing you today. Uh, but we do have this, it's drawing 790. You can find it on the NRCS website. It goes into the trench trenching stuff in the middle here that you, that Riley talked about. Uh, we have the slope up here in the right upper left corner, the slope application installation, uh, virtually the same drawing down here in the bottom left for channel application. Um, bottom right has the staple patterns and those correspond to different slope. Um, and you'll notice the only the last two pertain to channel staple patterns. Yeah, I just wanted to let you guys know that that's available. If you have any specific questions on it, we can talk about them. Otherwise, you just you know familiarize yourself with it. Look to include it in a plan if you're using these products in your construction plan. One thing I do want to say about this is it's great that we have the standard drawing, but if there are specific manufacturer instructions, those would override any Thing that would be on this standard drawing. So I have an example here of some install instructions. Let's have a slope application and channel application. So we want to make sure we're in the appropriate application. This one has a shoreline application as well. Um, you come down here and then it explains uh, staple patterns. So this particular one, it was on the PAL, the DOT PAL list. For some reason, DOT PAL list only, you can see down here, right, hopefully you can see, it says 3.7 staples per square yard in this bottom right staple pattern. For some reason, the DOT calls out a 3.8 staples per square yard. So for whatever reason, the DOT says, when, if you can use this map, but you need a few more staples. So for whatever reason, things to keep track of. Um, Riley talked about staple length because that's been a problem when I've had erosion control matting. Uh, I want to say the person that they bought, the contractor bought the matting from 
on our last job sent staples right along with it and they were shorter than what I would have recommended. But it did appear that they were approved by the manufacturer, so we went with it. We did the trench at the top um, and that particular application where we were working for that one wasn't worried. Um, there, but thought I'd bring that up. Just going through my notes here. Give me a second to make sure I haven't missed anything. Oh, I did take a note earlier when Ryan, uh, when Riley was talking. Um, Riley said that he hasn't seen a lot of need for the coconut blanket in our area because of how quickly our vegetation establishes compared to other areas. Um, I will say that I've recommended coconut blankets before and so have my counterparts a lot of times for those areas that have that are of special concern in the waterway but don't necessarily need a full a turf reinforcement matting so maybe something that's seeing super critical flow um, in a waterway that need you think needs a little more protection to get it established but that temporary erosion control matting just isn't doing it. I mean, the straw one isn't doing it, the one that's only going to last a year. Or the, so then you get a longer term, but not permanent matting protection for that area. So again, just for our standard purposes, that still temporary protection, it's just a greater protection than the straw blankets are going to provide. And O'Reilly doesn't like the use of the straw blankets as much in the channel. Uh, I have seen success with those. If nothing else, just alleviating a raindrop impact when that storm starts, um, it stays there. So I'm pretty sure we've all seen those grass waterways where you mulch them in with traditionally with just spreading that straw out. Um, and then that rainstorm comes and all that mulch is at the bottom of your waterway. At least the blanket keeps that mulch in your waterway after the first storm. Whether or not your seed's there, I guess, is a different question, but your, your mulch is still there. Um, I think that's all I have today for the road control parks. I want to thank Riley for giving his part of this presentation. Um, it's a lot more natural for him to give this presentation than it is for me, so it took that off of me. Um, he's also able to respond to those questions much better than I would have been able to. Oh, and I, earlier Penny gave me credit for coming up with the idea of the, offering this webinar. I'd like to give credit where credit is due. The Northeast area provided this training first, and I copied their idea after we found it was valuable to have Riley give the presentation. Uh, and Penny is the one that took it much wider than just, uh, you know, my goal was the Southwest area because that's who I cater to. Penny took it out to the wider audience, which is always good. Just wanted to point that out because it was not my original idea. I stole it. So that is all I have for you guys today. Are there any questions? Oh, here's one from Jess. We have heard that the Wisconsin DOT PAL PAL will be updated at some point. Is there any way we could send a question to the DOT to ask about this progress? So I can look into that, but I will say it has been updated in the last three years. It's been updated since I started working for DADCAP. They had to go out and find a new one. Not all of the classes were updated for some reason, though. I don't know if you've heard that there's going to be a recent one or maybe those pages that weren't updated this last time around will be updated. But, um, definitely can look into I don't even know who to ask yet. But I will look into that and try to get an answer out. Great. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate everybody asking questions today. That um, is good. We appreciate that to have a little bit of interaction. I think we'll um, close it down for now. And if you have other questions, please feel free to email Riley or Kelly or me, and I will find someone else that probably has an answer for you. And I've been getting emails from people for your PDHs. We'll get, I'll get those out to you in the near future. Um, but send those in if you haven't sent me anything so far. Otherwise, not seeing any more. 
Thanks much, Riley and Kelly. And everybody have a great day. I think the weather's going to be fantastic. So hopefully we can all get out there and enjoy it. Okay. Take care, everyone. Stay well.